Imagine walking down a street in a city you have never visited before. Suddenly you round a corner and a scene unfolds in front of you. The vendor hawking his wares. The lyrical tones of the traffic. The shadows cast by imposing structures. You're overtaken by a staggering sense that you've been there before. Many believe we have, in fact, been here before, in a different time, different place, and a different body. This process of death and rebirth is known as reincarnation. But is it simply a comforting belief to help take the sting out of our mortality? Or, as a growing number of researchers claim, is there valid evidence that reincarnation exists? Hello, I'm Bill Curtis. On this program, the Dalai Lama recognizes a young boy as the reincarnation of a Tibetan spiritual leader. A woman has memories of another lifetime and looks for her past life children. And a birth defect disappears when a boy claims to remember his death on a battlefield in Europe. For those who require scientific proof, reincarnation is a difficult concept to grasp and may always remain unexplained. On June 17, 1972, in Vancouver, Canada, Carol Airy gave birth to her second child. She and her husband Isaac named the boy Elijah. The doctor assured the couple that all had gone well. The only problem was the baby's feet. Carol Airy noticed them when she held Elijah for the first time. I unwrapped him and his feet were like as if you had been sitting, if, you, if one had been sitting in a lotus position, his feet were completely turned up. The doctor told Elijah's parents that it was a commonplace deformity and could be corrected with surgery and special leg braces. The Aries, who had recently converted to Buddhism, wondered if it was a sign of something more. Elijah was born on an auspicious day on the Buddhist calendar. Tibetans celebrate it as the day the Buddha attained enlightenment, a day reserved for the deepest respect. When Elijah was two years old, the Aries moved to Montreal. There they established a small Tibetan Buddhist center. Spiritual leaders or lamas would frequently visit the center to give talks. One afternoon in 1975, young Elijah joined the small audience. The three-year-old became entranced with a particular lama visiting from Tibet. He went into the room and went to sit very quietly, staring at him, just staring, like, but very intently. Uh, it was a bit strange, but kids are kids and they do funny things. That night, Carol claims that when she tucked Elijah into bed, the little boy made a startling announcement. He told his mother that he used to have a spiritual teacher. He called him by name and described in detail the room that he had lived in. At first, Carol dismissed this talk. Then Elijah broke into a strange language a tongue that sounded to Carol like Tibetan. She froze in place. I suppose if I was sitting in the seat of a skeptic, I would say, oh, give me a break, like it's just normal, you know, everyday occurrences. But when he was three and started speaking like that, I'm sorry, that wasn't normal. And no one will convince me that it was just a child having fantasy. Carol was extremely puzzled by her son's behavior. What had prompted him to come up with such a story? And how had he learned these foreign words? Elijah's parents decided to consult with the visiting Lama. 
The Lama listened as Elijah spouted off names. Geshe Kunawa, Mahakala Nakpo, names of Buddhist monks he recognized. The next day, the Lama flew to a monastery in India. He promised the Aries he would research the matter. Elijah, he told them, was a very special boy. Over the next few years, Elijah's stories began to grow in scope and detail, taking on a life of their own. I come from a beautiful planet, he told them, where the mountains are towering jewels, the trees take on curious shapes, and the roads are long and dusty. Elijah says he has no doubt that these places were real. I did not perceive it to be a memory. I perceived it to be actual information, sort of like news that was to be reported. It was actual images that I was having at the time and experience that I was going through at the time that I was relating. Three years went by with no word from the Lama. At age six, Elijah says the images were so real, he offered to take his sisters to visit his planet in their dreams. One night, the three of them made sandwiches, bundled up in warm clothes, and settled into Elijah's bed for the journey. I'm sure my parents got tons of phone calls from my teachers and, and whatnot, you know, saying, your son's imagination is, is terrific, but you know, what are you teaching him? What is going on at home? And things like that, because you know, everyone just thought I had a wild imagination. Elijah's parents were starting to believe it was more than just an active imagination. Later that year, they received a letter from the Lama. Elijah, he informed them, had been a Buddhist holy man in a past life. He had died in Tibet in the 1950s and now had chosen to return. There was no doubt about it. In 1980, the Dalai Lama the spiritual leader of Tibet made his first trip to the West. One of his first stops was Montreal. Carol arranged to take eight-year-old Elijah to see him. What happened at the meeting surprised even Elijah. I went up to him um, with a white scarf, which is the traditional offering for lamas, and um, he, he said, I know you, I know who you, who you are. You're the reincarnation of Geshe Jetse. And uh, I was sort of taken aback at, at, for, for a bit. A photo captures the moment of recognition. With a hint of surprise in his eyes, the Dalai Lama extends his arm and points his finger directly at young Elijah. That's when sort of my eyes were opened. It was like before um, I was living in, in in another world almost. And suddenly I came into the reality of the whole thing and it really hit me. The Dalai Lama assigned him a Tibetan name. From here on out, Elijah would be known as Tenzin Shirab. Tenzin learned everything he could about the man he calls his predecessor, a monk named Geshe Jatse. He lived during some of Tibet's most tumultuous times, witnessing the invasion and subsequent Chinese occupation of his country. He was known as a great scholar and devout holy man who had many disciples and excelled at debate. With his new identity, Tenzin was about to embark on a lifelong journey as a supposed reincarnated holy man in the modern Western world. At eight years of age, Elijah Eri was officially recognized by the Dalai Lama as the reincarnation of a revered Tibetan monk and renamed Tenzin Shirab. The news did not surprise the boy in the least. His parents and grandparents, however, were stunned. It was a very wild ride to come out and say, hey, guess what, you know, and uh, tell them, like, uh, my son's been recognized, your grandson has been recognized as one of the highest meditation teachers of Tibet. 
Isn't that wonderful? Intellectually, Carol and Isaac believed in reincarnation. Emotionally, they were torn. Their own flesh and blood, this child they had raised, was now being told he belonged to another world. The parents wanted to keep the family together. Tibetan leaders, on the other hand, insisted that Tenzin return to them. Over the next few years, the Aries traded letters back and forth with Tibetan religious leaders. They put off repeated pleas to send the Tibetans their Lama. But when the Dalai Lama himself asked Tenzin to join them, the Aries gave in. Tenzin was only 14 years old. It was the most difficult decision of his mother's life. I know that there'll be people watching this and they'll wonder, how could anybody possibly send their child away? But sometimes in life you have to do things that you don't want to do. But it wasn't easy at all. It was very difficult. That's why I cry. It happened and I was, I, you know, I knew it would at, at some time. And when it did, I, I greeted it with my arms open. You know, I said, well, okay, you know, let's do it. In October of 1986, Carol and Isaac, now separated, agreed their son should go to India. Tenzin and his mother boarded a plane to begin their journey east to the Sera Monastery in southern India, home to 2,500 monks. Tenzin felt immediately at ease in their midst. He was very comfortable within the monastery. It wasn't a foreign environment. He wasn't anxious. He wasn't nervous about it. He was very, very relaxed. He went right into the life like a fish to water. Tenzin's early experiences at the Sera Monastery seemed to confirm his reputation as the reincarnated holy leader. The monks said he looked remarkably like his predecessor, Geshe Jatse. Tenzin learned to speak the Tibetan language in just a few months and proved adept at memorizing complicated religious texts. He also mastered the time-honored tradition of Buddhist debate. <laughs> In the shelter of his hilltop monastery, Tenzin meditated, searching his mind for the truth. Was he really a reborn spirit? Some small part of him feared it was all a hoax. Buddhist philosophy encourages skepticism. It is one of the Buddha's teachings. The Buddha always said, don't take what I say as pure gold. Pure gold, if you cut it, it stays gold all through. Um, you have to... Um, to know if it's if it's true, analyze it, put it into practice, try it, see if it's true. If it's not, then don't take my advice, then don't pray to me. To Tibetan Buddhists, reincarnation is as evident as the stars and the moon. Much as Westerners have studied the frontiers of outer space, Tibetan scholars have studied the frontiers of the human mind. They have systematically analyzed the death process since the 7th century AD. They claim they have thousands of documented cases of people's past life memories. These cases, they say, are proof that the human soul is an energy source that survives even after the body expires. It is a scientific belief, certainly. They believe they've explored and investigated this realm, that they have uh, personally experienced th this realm and remember their transitions through these realms. And uh, therefore, they sort of have experimental evidence by reliable, reported by reliable researchers as far as they're concerned. After five years of intense study in India, Tenzin was convinced he was the reincarnated spirit of Jatse. But Tenzin felt he would be more approachable as a lay person and better able to fulfill his purpose in the West. With the blessing of the Dalai Lama, he relinquished his vows and returned to a Western lifestyle. Tenzin moved to Paris, where he began studying philosophy. He is a typical Westerner, spending time with his wife, 
working on his computer, and playing hockey on weekends. He blends right in. Tenzin says he still feels a deep connection to his past life as an enlightened Buddhist monk. He hopes to teach one day at a Western university. In that way, he feels he can pass on his knowledge, his wisdom, and fulfill his karma as a holy man. Is reincarnation the most logical explanation for the things Tenzin supposedly knew as a three-year-old boy? Most Western researchers don't believe so. These are all what I call comforting beliefs. They're things that people want to believe in. And I have to admit that I'm not hostile to the idea. I mean, I, I would like to, to think that uh, I and the ones I love uh, uh, would live on after this existence, but I, I can't see any reason to believe that. And, and uh, it flies in the face of everything that I do in my work in the lab. Extensive research into the human brain has helped scientists better understand the nature of memory. The brain doesn't work like a videotape recorder, storing life experiences in chronological order so that we can play them back at a later date. Instead, memory is stored in fragments and can easily be distorted by emotion, the passage of time, and new experiences. One of the most common forms of memory distortion is known as cryptoamnesia, or source amnesia. We can all pick up stuff that uh, we're exposed to and it can lodge in our brains and it can come back to us without the tags that tell us where and when we learned it and, and therefore it can feel like it's spontaneous and like we must have picked it up in some previous existence because we don't remember picking it up in this one. Even young children, researchers explain, have the ability to pick up on subtle cues and details and commit them to memory. They say this is most likely what occurred in Tenzin's case. We've got the parents who have converted to Buddhism at the time of the birth of the boy. We've got Tibetan lamas coming uh, to the house. Who knows what language uh, they might have been speaking in front of the boy? Who knows what um, movies might have been played? Who knows what books might have been read out loud? A combination of early exposure coupled with unintentional coaching from his parents, could explain how Tenzin came up with names and places, how he was able to speak Tibetan words at age three and learn the language with ease at age 14. The Aray family does not totally dismiss such arguments, but believes they don't explain everything. There's many things that in the world that, that we don't have the capability yet of knowing because we just haven't developed the technology or whatever. And I think we have to be open-minded to these things. There's nothing to prove perfectly, 100%, that reincarnation exists, that, that I am the reincarnation of such and such a person. There are similarities, physical similarities, between me and my predecessor. Um, how do you explain that? It could be coincidence, if you believe in coincidence. I don't know of any other explanation than the explanation of reincarnation. Reincarnation is most often associated with Eastern mysticism and the religions of Asia. However, some people of Christian faiths have their own stories of rebirth to tell. One British woman started to question her Protestant upbringing after becoming convinced she had lived before. From a very young age, Jenny Coquel says she was plagued with visions of her death. They would come to her at night as she slept. The feelings often lingered on to haunt her during the day. These were not visions of a future death, but one in the recent past. Jenny was born in 1953 in southern England. On the surface, her life was like any other child's in the village of St. Albans. But underneath, Jenny's life was different. When I was a child, I would think about my previous adulthood and my previous childhood. And 
as I was growing up, it, it didn't it seem incongruous in any way. It was just ordinary memory, and it was just a normal part of my life. Until, of course, I realised that other people didn't have quite the same um, experiences. What Jenny remembered with precise detail was the life of a young Catholic woman named Mary, who struggled to raise eight children in Ireland. I knew it was the turn of the century up until the 1930s. Um, I, it was, you'd think it would be from historic cues, looking at the, 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 the costume, the dress, um, perhaps the lifestyle. It wasn't, I just knew. Yes, the, the, looking back at it, the historic cues were there, but when I was a small child, I wouldn't have recognized them anyway. Her most vivid memories, she says, were of Mary's death. The images played in her mind like a movie on a large screen. She saw a stark hospital room, a simple window. I remember seeing the body on the bed in the room, not wanting to leave. And I'd just wake up often at that point where I'd left the body, uh, night after night, and wake up in tears because I knew I couldn't change it. I knew it had happened. Jenny's mother didn't know what made her five-year-old daughter cry at night. Her first clue came after Jenny attended Sunday school for the first time. She was perched on a stool beside me and she said they keep talking about the afterlife and what it'll be like in heaven after you're dead. She said nobody said anything about what it was like in their last life. Is it one of those things grown-ups don't talk about, you know, that as children say these things. And I was a bit, a bit surprised to say the least of it. Jenny would sit by the fire and draw detailed pictures. A small two-room cottage near a bubbling stream. Pictures hanging in oval frames on the wall. One of a woman with a child, the other of a soldier. A jetty where she would wait for someone whose face she couldn't make out. She also drew a series of maps in hopes of being able to pinpoint the town in her memories. Scouring maps of Ireland, she kept returning to a speck called Malahide. I don't remember how old she was, probably six or seven, and she drew a map and she said this was the place where she lived, or had lived. Um, she didn't know whereabouts it was, but it was a little map, a little street map. And she said, and then you go down here to the cottage and there's the stream and laid it all out. Pat became more and more perplexed by her daughter's strange claims. She did her best to shrug it off as typical childish behavior. Deep inside, however, she wondered if there weren't something to it. Jenny was insistent and her stories never changed. Jenny said the most overwhelming memories were of her eight children. She knew each one of their names, knew their faces, their personalities, and she constantly worried about them. The death itself wasn't um, a horrific thing, but the leaving the children behind and the fear of what was going to happen to the children and my responsibilities as a mother. I suppose that would seem a little incongruous for a small child to have those responsibilities but it didn't seem so. As Jenny grew older, the memories refused to fade. She felt a constant need to search for her lost children, but knew she couldn't ask her own parents to take her to Ireland. It wasn't until after she married and had children of her own that she was able to act on these recollections. In the spring of 1980, determined not to lose those memories, Jenny took one of her childhood maps to a local bookstore. She found her hand-drawn map closely resembled an actual map of Malahide. She then consulted a hypnotist in hopes of learning more details. Going through that process of the hypnosis, I found that the memories were all of a sudden right at the top of my mind again. Uh, I couldn't um, ignore them anymore. I couldn't leave it, wait, be patient. I had to do something straight away, and that something was to go back to Ireland and walk through the streets. But Jenny had kids of her own to take care of, and money was tight. It took nine years, but finally, in June 1989, she traveled to Malahide. 
10 miles northeast of Dublin. First, she found the jetty. Then she spotted the small Catholic church she believed she had attended. And after searching through a field of rubble, she found the ruins of the cottage where she remembered living as Mary. Everything was exactly where it should have been according to her childhood maps. It was great walking back through Malahide after all that time and finding my way around, recognizing things, knowing where I was. Uh, I had a map, didn't need it. It was, um, I knew I was coming home. Jenny's search was just beginning. She learned that a woman named Mary had in fact lived in the cottage and her last name was Sutton. When Mary died in the 1930s, her children were sent to orphanages. Jenny guessed some of them must still be alive. She was determined to find them. Haunted throughout childhood by memories of another person's life, Jenny Coquel came to believe she was the reincarnation of Mary Sutton, a young Irish woman who died in 1932, leaving behind eight children. Using these memories as her guide, Jenny located the village of Malahide where Mary had lived. Now she was determined to find Mary's children. I was very bothered about getting it absolutely right because I wanted to make sure if I found this family that it was the family that I remember. Jenny was determined. She placed ads in local newspapers and wrote to all the area orphanages and anyone bearing the last name Sutton. Finally, her persistence paid off. Jenny was able to locate Mary's marriage license and the children's baptismal records. The whole time I think I was concerned about how I was going to approach the family because I realized that I was going to get to the point where I was going to find them. And I was quite concerned about how I was going to approach them. Whether I had any right to approach them, because obviously I see it, I have the memories of being their mother. I turn up, I'm in a different body, but I have the memories of their mother. At last, she tracked down Mary's oldest son, Sonny, and mentally prepared herself to make the phone call. What exactly should she say to him? He was only 13 at the time of his mother's death, but likely to have lasting impressions of her. Jenny took a deep breath and dialed the number. I've been dreaming of your family, she says since I was about five or six years old. So I know it's not right to ask a lady her age, but how old are you? She, I'm 39. So my brain started working again. So you're 39. That means my mother died 21 years before you were born, he said. Jenny was silent for a moment. Then, tenderly, she proceeded to recount some of her memories. She described the two photographs she saw hanging on the wall of the cottage, black and white pictures in oval frames. One of a mother and child, the other a soldier. The accuracy of Jenny's intimate recollections sent a chill down Sonny's spine. When uh, we finished our phone call, I come and I sat down in the armchair beside my wife. And she looked at me and she says, my God, she says, what's wrong with you? She said, you look like a ghost. So you always say, I think I'll be talking to my mother. Jenny made plans to meet with Sonny in person and compare memories. She gave me the first half and then right away, that's it. You understand? I knew right away what you're talking about. She saw herself waiting on the jetty, but for whom? She was waiting for Sonny to return from working as a caddy at a nearby golf course. She saw herself standing in front of the cottage, wrestling with a mattress, but why? Once a year, they replaced the chaff in the mattresses and then struggled to fit them through the doorway. With each shared discovery, the conviction grew stronger. Jenny appeared to be the reincarnation of Sonny's mother. Fragments of her memory fit the life of Mary Sutton. Jenny was ecstatic to finally connect the pieces. Still though, she worried about the rest of the Sutton children. 
With more research and Sonny's assistance, she was able to locate the five surviving siblings. After 60 years of separation, the family was finally reunited. I've been trying to do it for nearly 60 years, was to find my family, my brothers and my sisters, right? So Jenny has found them. Now that has given me a great relief and a release of life. I know where my brothers and sisters are now. My need to find out if the children were all right, it was my need. Um, it was my need left over from when I was Mary, but I had to find out they were all right. I felt responsibility for them. Um, it was still my job, regardless of the fact that I had changed, I was in a different body. It was still my responsibility to make sure that they were all right, to do something for them. Today, Jenny lives with her husband and two children. At last, Jenny says she has found peace in her life. The peace that evaded her until she traveled to the town of Malahide and walked the streets once again. Is it possible that Jenny knew the intimate details of a woman who lived and died before she was born? Critics say it's more reasonable to view Jenny's story as another example of false memory, as they maintain most claims of reincarnation are. Were Sonny's memories shaped by Jenny's impressions? Or were Jenny's recollections subsequently inspired by conversations with Sonny? The big mistake here is just to take the story without probing. And, and the way to really do it is to try to break the story. And so anybody who claims to have been alive in a previous incarnation at a previous time should have a storehouse of knowledge. You know, what do people typically eat for breakfast? Uh, whose face was on the most common coin that was used every day? The problem, scientists say, is that the individuals involved in the stories, not to mention the researchers who investigate them, are looking for confirmation of their beliefs rather than denial. And it's not hard to find, given the ease with which human memory can be contaminated. In almost all the work I do on false memories, memory distortion, the construction of false memories, the people I study, the people I see, they're people who really believe that they've had these experiences. We're not dealing with deliberate liars. We're dealing with something like an honest liar, someone who, who's, who, who thinks that's really their, their past. I would see Jenny's feeling that she had lived before not necessarily proving reincarnation, but in some way the grace of God allowing a message to go to that person so that she could come back, gather the family together, reassure them that everything was all right, everything was in God's hands. Sonny Sutton and his five surviving brothers and sisters don't know how to explain Jenny Coquel's amazing story. Sonny, however, was in a unique position to be able to validate or dismiss her memories. He says they are accurate and that no one else could have known them. As the sole fact is, so when I sit down and think, and I'm on my own, and I think back to my childhood and what Jenny has done, there must be something somewhere out there. My mother was with her. My mother is in her. And all of my mother, my mother did not rest until she knew that the family was reunited. I find it difficult when people look upon it just as a, a, a belief as I don't actually believe in reincarnation, I have experienced it. I know that's how things happen. Are birth defects somehow linked to tragedies from a past life? A growing number of past life researchers believe there is a direct correlation between the physical ailments we suffer in this life and traumatic events we experienced in a former life. Before he reached age two, Patricia Austrian knew that her son Edward was different from his six older siblings. On rainy days at their home in Connecticut, Edward would cry uncontrollably and tell strange stories. As he wept, Edward talked over and over about his shot and pointed to his neck.
His parents did not understand what he was saying. I just figured this is who my son is, and that's it. You accept him for who he is. Edward was a sickly child. He suffered from chronic sore throats and repeated bouts with tonsillitis. In 1988, when Edward was four, his father Donald, a doctor of internal medicine, took his son to a specialist. Edward was diagnosed with a rare birth defect, a cyst on the thyroglossal duct in the front of the neck. If left untreated, the cyst could become infected and lead to death. It would have to be surgically removed. But first, the doctor wanted to remove the source of the infection, Edward's tonsils. A few weeks later, Edward was admitted to the hospital for a tonsillectomy. The surgery went smoothly, and Edward awoke announcing that he would not need to have another. That evening, four-year-old Edward told his mother a peculiar tale. He insisted that he had been an 18-year-old soldier named James, trudging through the mud on a dismal day in France. He didn't know what year, what war. Tired, cold, and hungry, his arms ached from the weight of the gun he carried. Without warning, he heard a shot ring out from behind. I just remember getting hit right back here, in the back of the neck, and it went and it penetrated through to about right here into my neck. He said he tasted the salt, the salty taste of blood. It filled him. He choked. He gagged, he fell in the mud, and he died. He died there in the mud. Patricia didn't know what to make of her son's story. At first, she shrugged it off, assuming it was a child's fantasy or the lingering effects of the anesthesia. Two days after the tonsillectomy, Donald noticed the cyst in the front of his son's neck had completely disappeared. Immediately, he called Edward's doctor. I had to concur, the cyst had been completely resolved and completely gone. I anticipated that, in, if anything, this was an unusual event, and anticipated that the cyst would return. It never has. Not only did Edward's cyst disappear, but his personality changed. He wasn't afraid to be alone anymore. He didn't get anxious, even on the gloomiest days. He did, however, feel the need to repeat his tale. Time and again, he rehashed the story of his life as a soldier. It wasn't my four-year-old talking. He had a grasp and a knowledge of things that a four-year-old child is just not exposed to. Patricia could no longer ignore her son's stories. She was convinced there had to be something to them and felt they might be somehow linked to the disappearance of Edward's cyst. After several months of intensive research, she found an explanation that made sense to her. Perhaps Edward was healed by confronting his death in a past life. Could Edward's stories of life and death as a soldier in France have been carried over from a past life? And if so, could they be the source of his unexpected cure? A contingent of past life therapists and researchers are convinced. At a very early age, Edward had a fairly complete recollection of what it was like to be a soldier and what it was like to die on a battlefield. And he had a corresponding physical problem in his neck. Bowman explains that by expressing those memories, Edward was finally able to confront the loneliness and fear he experienced in a past life. And as a result, his physical and emotional problems went away. After reviewing and rehashing all this stuff again and again, and had having heated discussions with my wife and other family members, I had to come to the conclusion that there was no other explanation that was plausible. And believe me, I had sat up at night thinking of other ways. 
As citizens in a free society, they have every right to believe it if they want. But if they tell me I have, um, I have scientific evidence of an afterlife or of reincarnation or something, now they're playing in my court and now they've got to play by my rules and they've got to come up with, with satisfactory evidence that uh, is compelling. And I don't see anything that compels me to believe in reincarnation at all. There are scientists all over the world who have been investigating children's spontaneous past life memories since the early 60s with rigorous scientific methods. And they have documented literally thousands of cases of children from every part of the world who have these memories. In this state, in this state, the memory is very enhanced. Most of the evidence cited is found in the form of case studies developed from people who have either spontaneously recalled past life memories or have recovered them through hypnotic regression. Critics maintain this so-called evidence is dubious. Human memory, they say, is especially impressionable under hypnosis. Once they buy into some suggestion during this hypnotic process, they can become very, very confident that they had these experiences. I've been doing this now for about 18 years, and I've gotten very adept at separating out what is what, symbol, metaphor, dreamlike material, actual past life memories, imagination. Regression therapy is merely the act of going backwards in the concentrated or hypnotic state. So whether you go back to last week, or to your adolescence, or childhood, or infancy, or to past lives. It's all regression therapy. Scientists, however, insist humans are incapable of forming reliable memories during the first few years of life. Which raises the obvious question. If we can't access memories from the beginning of this life, how could we possibly have memories from prior lives? The Tibetan explanation parallels the Darwinian theory of evolution. If a species can evolve with the passing of time in order to adapt to its environment, why can't a soul evolve across many lifetimes? Over many millennia, the ape becomes the human. Likewise, the soul of one person evolves into the improved soul of another. There's an old saying from the mystics, which I like very much. And the saying is, we are not human beings having a spiritual experience here, but we are spiritual beings having a human experience. Scientists, of course, have a different view. They compare the human brain to the engine of a car. When you shut off the engine, residual energy dissipates in the form of heat. Similarly, when a person dies, the energy generated from the brain dissipates into the environment as heat. Human consciousness simply stops. It becomes nothing. But believers in reincarnation do not accept this. If you think for a moment clearly, there can be no evidence for the existence of nothing. Nothingness is one thing that you can never prove. Scientists know there is no proof that a soul disappears when the body dies, but argue that neither is there any evidence to suggest it lives on. What the reincarnationist is asking me to believe is that even though the organ dies and reverts back to the uh, simple chemicals from which it's ultimately made, it'll plunk down inside the brain of a developing fetus and it'll force into that complex brain in all the information that allows them to know things, to feel things, to have the abilities, to have the a thoughts and experiences and, and motivations of a brain that took a whole lifetime to get organized. And I just find that totally incredible. Defenders point once again to what they believe is good evidence. Thousands of documented cases of children who have unexplainable memories of past lives. There is ample evidence of reincarnation. Now, maybe you can then, after you examine that evidence, you can say, well, I'm still not persuaded. Naturally, that's the scientific process, but you can't say there's no evidence. I don't think it could ever be possible to physically prove it. We're talking about the realm of faith. This is a level deep, deep down, far deeper than matter and material things.
In 1991, astronomer Carl Sagan interviewed the Dalai Lama, a meeting of science and faith. Carl Sagan wanted to know, if I were to give you proof that reincarnation did not exist, what would you do? The Dalai Lama replied, I'd stop believing tomorrow. But how would you go about designing such a study? Carl Sagan didn't have an answer. For most, a belief in reincarnation still requires a leap of faith and will likely remain unexplained.